right. Hiéroglyphe dont s'exalte le millier a propagé de l'aile un frisson familier. I think you can see this quote by Malarmé right here. And I think that the metaphor is quite telling. This conception of Richard Wagner's operas as relying on a mysterious and thrilling language to be deciphered is actually a familiar trope as old as the composer himself. One thinks of fantasy and symbolist ramblings, such as this one, but uh, also uh, to many other scholarly references and more academic references to a Wagnerian web of sign. However, strangely enough, enough, such a critical dimension of Wagnerian opera has largely remained at the level of metaphorical abstraction, this idea of Wagnerian total art being a language. But the question that I'm asking is, what exactly is this language, and how do we read it, and what all this implies? This question will lead me to explore an understated dimension of Wagnerian dramaturgy. What I wish to show is that Wagnerian total art, in that it relies on multimedia association of light motifs, is characterized by a high degree of linguistic ostentation, in Bonobart's words. And in this regard, it may anticipate many aspects of what Jacques Concierge later called spectatorial emancipation, which will be so crucial to early 20th century drama and opera, as I will detail in the theoretical framework of this study originates in Wagner's own reflections on total art communication and in his proposed reform of the musical dramatic genre, which aspired to move from the solely musical focus of opera at the time towards a syncretic form of dramatic art, which we all know. This aims to reach a better understanding of motivic signification and spectatorial emancipation as well as to suggest new ways of reading contemporary staging practices focused specifically on Wagner's works. Notwithstanding the now familiar Nietzschean or Edwardian criticism of Wagner's music as being violently hypnotic and inducing a kind of passive submission of the listener to the throes of spectacle, Wagnerian cognition may in fact be far more critical than is usually credited to it. And this is I'd like to show. Perhaps in regard to its modernist posterity, Wagnerian music drama may have somehow earned its self-proclaimed and even pompous epithet of the artwork of the future. Now, in my musicological research work, I usually start by expounding on a thorough and fastidious linguistic apparatus in order to theoretically model the way Wagnerian communication works in musical semiotic terms. However, I'm going to reassure you by saying that this is not what I will be doing today, as I'm perfectly aware of the fact that this is not a specialized musical conference, so I spare everyone my usual analytical uh, hocus pocus. Instead, I think it would be more productive to stick to specific passages from the operas. And the LIDRC team have provided the piano. Uh, with, after much mishaps and difficulties, <laughs> we've got it. And I only hope that you won't regret it by the time I finish my presentation. <laughs> but first, a few generalities on what I mean by motivic associativity in Wagner's musical dramatic works. So Wagner's conception of total art or Gesamtkunst has by now become a kind of buzzword, yet it still suggests a number of important questions. So I hope you can all see. Wagner's profuse theorizing about a new form of music drama that would unite different artistic expressions sought to reform the operatic genre at the time. Seeking to closely bind opera's three media, music, text, and scene, in theory, Wagner famously employed an increasingly systematized compositional device, namely what we now call the leitmotif, or leading motif. Contrary to popular belief, however, I argue that the Wagnerian leitmotif is far from being simply a recurring musical figure. Instead, I want to emphasize that it unites in an almost linguistic way a musical, a verbal, and a theatrical expression related to the same idea of the plot. In more technical terms, and here I hand a little bit to semiotics, uh, a leitmotif, one could say, binds three multimedia signifiers to one common 
signified, thus embodying Wagner's syncretic ideal on the level of its most basic unit. So, what's important to note is that nowhere is this handling of the leitmotif as dense and as resourceful as in Wagner's ring cycle. So Wagner's epic tetralogy that represents the composer's political symbolism and his conception of human history. Now, obviously, I do not mean to unpack and summarize the whole plot and the ramifications of the rain plot right now. Suffice to say that I will draw on several scenes from the cycle in order to study motivic associativity and its role in shaping a pre-modern spectatorship. Now, so music, yay. Consider the first options of the so-called Valhalla motif in Das Reinhold, sorry, in Das Reinhold scene two. So when the Valhalla fortress appears on stage, as we see in the image right there, we hear the following musical passage interrupted by the brass section of the orchestra. <laughs> as far as the tuning of the piano can give us an idea. It is followed by a short soliloquy by the Norse god Wotan, saying that the construction of the gods' new home is finally complete. So Wotan says, Auf Berges gipfel die Göteborg. And thus, the idea, or signified, of Valhalla as being the gods' abode is first established at this moment when three signifiers are presented together the musical orchestral passage, the words of Shortan describing the castle, and the visual image of Valhalla appearing on stage. So this is, in a very simple example, how the spectator comes to identify the so-called Valhalla leitmotif at its most basic stage, when we encounter the scene for the first time. So a connection is established between these musical, verbal, and theatrical units on the one hand, and the idea of Valhalla on the other. However, and most importantly, we should also keep in mind the fact that Wagner's language functions through intermotivic associativity, that is, the practice of linking motifs to other motifs or other signifying elements of the drama. And this is where it gets interesting. For instance, this is how the famous motivic web of the Rain Tetralogy generates statements, new meaning, meanings, premonitions. In other terms, this is where lies the motif's linguistic function for instance, looking at the same Valhalla motif now in associative context, let us turn to Die Valkyrie, the second opera of the cycle, and more specifically to Siegmund's monologue in Act 1, Scene 2. <laughs> the passage in which the hero relates his father Veils' vanishing into the woods, leaving only his wolf spells behind, is followed by a harsh occurrence of the same Valhalla motif played again by the brass section. So here's what Siegmund says first. This is a very straightforward example, actually. The listener is here able to intuit the musical dramatic connection in all its immediacy. Siegmund's words about his father, leading to the musical theme firmly established earlier as connected to the Valhalla, announces that his father is none other, other than the godhead Wotan, uh, who has now regained his lovely abode. Here, the first level of signification is the most obvious direct meaning of Siegmund's spoken line, related his father's inexplicable disappearance. However, the second meaning of this statement, the fact that Siegmund's father is actually Wotan, is generated by association when we hear the Valhalla motif commenting, so to speak, um, on the protagonist's words. This very simple associative example aptly illustrates the way most of the ring's famous signifying moments, the statements, anticipations, and flashbacks, are produced by motivic association. Associativity can actually get very complex, much more than this, in the course of the ring. Wagner's idea of total art is actually inextricably linked with a form of linguistic associativity, with which most uh, musicians and opera goers 
soon become quite familiar, if only intuitively. However, what is most interesting about Wagner's motivic syncretic writing is the fact that it entails a, an entirely new dimension of opera spectatorship. These few examples have shown how musical dramatic association involves a kind of active reading by the spectator in order for them to grasp all the statements, double meanings, and premonitions suggested by the interaction of music, words, and scene. When it comes to analyzing the cognition of such layered associativity, we must turn to our friend Roland Barthes seminal ideas on the ostentatious nature of multimedia communication. So throughout much of his critical output, Barthes drew crucial implications from what he called meta-language, or the illustration of one signifier by another, such as music mimicking a gesture, or an image illustrating a text, etc. For Bart, the spectator or the recipient of any such layered message is inevitably made aware of the author's signifying activity. Bart claims that this tautological layering of one meaning, illustrating or reformulating, it, or reformulating another, or one medium illustrating another, such as music commenting on a line of text or a gesture paralleling a musical motif, generates this kind of semiotic ostentation, which is a key con concept of Bach's critical theory, and which would be very useful to understand stagings of Wagner uh, in the while. Semiotic ostentation actually has shaped Bach's critical thinking on modern theatre specifically, and especially his reflections on Bertolt Brecht's dramaturgy, which would be quite relevant. Crucially then, a focus on semiotic ostentation can help us better grasp how novel the spectatorship implied by Wagner's Gesamtkunst, language, truly was. In other terms, associativity that relies on such an overdetermined metalinguistic layering produces, to quote Barth, an awareness of language at work, which Barth calls ideology elsewhere, which is not to be confused with the term's usual political meaning. Thus, multimedia associativity is highly self-referential in a way as it conveys the very idea that syncretic signification is being constructed before our eyes and ears in opera. Drawing one last time on the previous Siegmund example, semiotic ostentation is simply our awareness of the workings of total art communication. It emerges from our metalinguistic association between the Valhalla musical motif and Siegmund's line about his father. As Wagnerian opera goes, far from being passive beholders, we are thus maintained in a situation of active and critical involvement, constantly aware, reading the multimedia associative statements that quilt the intricate motivic web of the Rinsheim. Could one see this even as a precocious form of musical dramatic verheimdung or estrangement, a major concern of modern theatrical practices in the following century? This focus on semiotic ostentation as an intrinsic part of Wagnerian Gesamtkunst has crucial implications for our argument today. It relates Wagner's motivic language to a larger body of works and reflections on the way theatre speaks to us while making us aware of its artifice, particularly when it comes to modern conceptions of drama, and that's where we think of Brecht. In line with Bach's account of semiotic ostentation, Jacques Rancière speaks of spectatorial emancipation. So for Rancière, critical and participative engagement is central to this conception of modern spectators, who become, quote, active participants instead of being passive warriors. Rancière also links this emancipation precisely to Brechtian spectatorship and to this dramatist's famous Verfremdungs effect, or distancing, alienating effect. Now, in the case of Wagner, in the case of Wagner's ring cycle specifically, and of the associative passages I am concerned with in the Tetralogy, one can note that the spectator's active and interpretative role is placed at the forefront of this Gesamtkunst experience. Thus, the emancipated Wagnerite, so to speak, um, is undoubtedly, to quote Rancière again, both a distant spectator and an active interpreter of the spectacle that is presented to him. 
Now, closely to our contemporary concerns, such a focus on the semiotic ostentation and spectatorial awareness that emerge from multimedia association can be more relevant to our understanding of current theatrical practices. So, since the turn of the 20th century, stage productions of Wagner's works have increasingly toyed with this kind of verfremdung. Semiotic ostentation actually lies at the center of contemporary regie theater practices, in which the director can give free reign to staging as a vector of critical thinking. What is generally meant today by the term regie theater is simply a focus on the stage director's role as conveyor of new meaning, as well as a defiance towards theatrical illusion and realism. Moreover, stage directors have been particularly keen on exploiting self-referentiality, tautology, and ostentation as a means of breaking theatrical illusion and achieving spectatorial verfremdung, specifically in Wagner's works. We can see this here. I don't know if you can see it from where you are on the image. Uh, an image taken from the 2017 production of Die Meister Singer von Nuremberg, Wagner's opera, by Barry Kosk, which features here Wagner as Hans Sachs conducting an opera on stage. I wish I could zoom on this, but here we are. So there's an orchestra on stage. And the tautological doubling of the orchestral music with its staged visual counterpart shows how devices such as mise en abîme or the featuring of a stage within a stage can actually induce a strong sense of spectatorial awareness. Are you able to see uh, over there? Yes. <laughs> right. Now, what interests me most in terms of Wagnerian and theater practices is the work of Peter Konvichny, since the early noughties approximately. Peter Konvichny, uh, is kind of considered emblematic of Regie Theater nowadays, although he distanced himself lately from this term. And Konvichny's practice is characterized by this kind of high degree of metalinguistic awareness, or as critic Walter Bernhard has termed it, of meta-referentiality. In describing the tautological treatment of music and staging in Konvichny's 2002 production of Die Meistersinger again in Hamburg, Bernard states that, quote, most of these strategies naturally serve a meta-referential function and draw audience attention to the fact that this is theater and that the director is manipulating theatrical devices. Indeed, Konvichny's conception of spectatorship and of dramatic awareness owes a great deal, specifically, to his interest, again, in Brechtian verfremdung or distanciation. So this emphasis on self-referentiality in Konvichny's practice thus resonates strongly with my claims about semiotic ostentation and spectatorial emancipation in Wagner's operas. Again, tiny images. So as far as the ring cycle now is concerned, some of Konvichny's most estranged, so to speak, staging choices can be found in his famous 2003 Goethe-Demerung, for the Stuttgart Staatsoper. And in his production, particularly in the second scene of the prologue, Konvichny's staging takes advantage of the aforementioned metalinguistic layering of musical, textual, and scenic components characteristic of the language of unit. The acting, in particular, exacerbates the tautological potential of the motivic language, as Siegfried and Brunhilde, the two main characters of the scene, which we can see here in image, react with almost automatic gestures to the sounding of their corresponding musical motifs. In other terms, each character on stage metalinguistically illustrates their musical motif, this time with a forceful, over-determined stage movement, which produces an acute awareness of Wagner's multimedia language. This aptly illustrates, albeit in a willfully extreme way, the potential of Wagnerian Gesamtkunst for ostentatious modes of signification and spectatorship. Friedrichmann's production here emphasizes an almost mechanical, systematic link between musical motifs as uttered by the orchestra and their corresponding consequences on stage action. This overdetermination generates an ostentatious and actually quasi-Pavlovian set of reflexes binding 
musical and theatrical expressions of the motif, as for instance, when the Ifrit reacts with a programmed warlike gesture to each utterance of his heroic motif, as follows. <laughs> Siegfried's motif, Siegfried springs up in a sort of very aggressive gesture. Actually, it's in the image right here, with a very stereotypical gesture each time we hear this motif, which kind of exacerbates its connection. And the same works with the other character, Corinne, right? when she basically swoons on demand each time her motif is sounded, which is this one. <laughs> Does this very uh, stereotypically feminine gesture? It's actually also in the image. She does this. So this systematized metalinguistic correlation of one language by the other here occurs in plain sight, exposing and exacerbating the very mechanisms of music drama signification. In this regard. Critic David J. Levin rightly argues that this highly formalized actress play in conventional staging of Richard Amelin put forth, I quote, a caricature of opera histrionics. This extreme case of musical dramatic self-reflexivity, oscillating between literalism and sardonic denunciation, is an apt illustration of what I have described as early spectatorial emancipation in Wagner. Here, the auto-reflexive commentary turns into a blatant parody of total art functionalism. Levin also compares this interpretation of Wagner's layered dramaturgy again and again to Brecht and Fefandel, which is kind of becoming a recurring theme of this presentation. And this is because of the strong perspectivism induced by the actress's highly formalized response to multimedia stimuli. So Brechtian and Wagnerian modes of self-referentiality here converge. The syncretic language of leitmotifs ostentatiously turns against itself in an act of questioning and ostentation, inciting the audience to grasp the full scope of its artifice. In conclusion, one might realize the significance of spectatorial emancipation in regard to Wagner's musical dramatic posterity, such as the 20th century avant-garde attempts to total art in Brechtian or Bauhaus theater. One also thinks of the virtual obsession with mise en abîme and perspectivism in Hickard Strauss's operas in the early 20th century. Such potential for a critical, constant solicitation of the Wagnerian spectator lies very far from the claims about Wagner's presumably hypnotic and mind-numbing ambitions, such as notably formulated by Nietzsche or Adorno. Rather, the so-called sorcerer of Bayreuth was remarkably concerned about elevating mundane opera going to the status of a heightened, multi-layered cognitive experience. The old wizard appears, after all, to have been far more preoccupied with spectatorial emancipation than is usually thought. Thank you, that was good.